told him they're going to be calibrating further future presidencies <laughs> by this one. <laughs> oh, congratulations. Keep um, worrying, I've got no place left to go but down. <laughs> no, thank you. That my hot one. Mr. President, uh, you went through a quite remarkable political transformation uh, right in the middle of your life uh, from a liberal Democrat to a conservative and a Republican. Um, to begin with, just how liberal a Democrat were you anyway? Well, the funny thing is, as I look back on it, I realize um, I took that term because in the days of the New Deal, uh, that's, uh, that was the term that was used with regard to uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt's uh, programs and so forth and in those horrendous days of the Great Depression. But when you look back and you realize that Franklin Delano Roosevelt ran on a platform of reducing the cost of government, of returning authority and autonomy to local and, uh, governments and state governments that he claimed had been unjustly seized by the federal government, and the elimination of useless boards and commissions and so forth. Well, that's my first, in fact, my first four votes were cast for Franklin Delano Roosevelt. But if you look today, did I leave the party or did the party leave me? Because which party would be supportive of that kind of a platform? And uh, that platform's pretty descriptive of what I've been trying to do ever since I held office. So that what you're saying actually is that uh, uh, the democratic positions that you supported were actually, uh, in, in comparative modern terms, uh, fairly conservative positions from the very start. Is that right? Yes. So there wasn't and that much of a change? No. And it, uh, it came on, more or less, uh, through my own uh, public speaking. I've, as you know, Bill, I've always, uh, I've always explained my after-dinner speaking and after-lunch speaking for all those years in Hollywood that if if you don't sing or dance, you wind up as an after-dinner speaker. And so uh, I did that, I did my own speeches, and uh, I tried to, at first I started out, I felt that I had to speak something on what I was doing anew, and so the subject of my speeches usually would be the real Hollywood versus the fictional version of it and the Tinseltown image that had been given to it. And this would be in the late 40s and, and early 50s? Well, it was post-World War post II and uh, on up there to around 1960. And then to justify my addressing, say, a Chamber of Commerce and explaining uh, how I could justify that kind of a speech to them, I would point out then the discriminations and many of them government. Uh, tax-wise and everything else against our industry because of that image. There wasn't going to be any politician stand up and defend <laughs> the bloated people of the tinsel world of Hollywood. And to further bring it home, I would say, and you know, if it can happen to one segment of the society, it can happen to you and your business or whatever. And the funny thing is, as I went on speaking that way, after the speech, increasingly people would buttonhole me on the way out, businessmen and so forth, and say, let me tell you what's happening to my business. Let me tell you the, the discrimination, regulation-wise and so forth of government. And pretty soon Hollywood began to be more or less shrink down to just an introduction, and I was actually writing speeches and delivering speeches on what was happening to the whole free economy in the United States until one day I went home from a speaking tour and said to Nancy, uh, it's just dawned on me that I'm out here speaking all the time on this subject, and then come election time, I go in and campaign for and vote for the people that are making these things happen. And uh, I said, it's time for me to change. Now, at the time that this was occurring in your own life, the conservative movement as we now know it was getting underway in the yes. 1950s. Uh, were you conscious of the movement or of, of uh, individuals or books or ideas in the movement, or did you develop uh, your own position a little bit independently of it? Well, as I say, I've explained how, uh, how I came to see mm -hmm. this by, through my own speeches, that in other words, someone else didn't talk me into it. But I'll tell you what was also happening then. I was searching always, since I did my own speeches, for information, for examples, and so forth. And so my reading uh, 
began to take a turn. I can't tell you exactly when I discovered National Review and Human Events, but I think both of them were more in the form of a newsletter uh, than the magazine and the tabloid-sized newspaper that they, they now are. But uh, it, the reading was started. I hadn't put a label on it or anything. The reading was seeking more information about what was happening to the private sector, how examples of government adversarial relationship. I remember one example, I don't know whether I have the numbers accurately or not, but pretty generally this, that oh, I seized upon and that was worth about, that one little example was worth about three pages of, of uh, information on the farm programs of what they had become as the New Deal went on and then through and post-war and so forth and the government's invasion of, of farming. And I think that government today and its programs have been largely responsible for the problems that have befallen our good farmers. But what I found, this one example was, I found that there were several government programs, funding programs, to uh, help poultry raisers increase egg production. And then there was another program, government program, that spent almost as much money buying up the surplus eggs. <laughs> now, you uh, are speaking here of the uh, impact on you then of regulation and of too much government as being one of the, perhaps the major factor, one of the major factors. And the tax policies. And tax policies. How about the problem of domestic communism and Whitaker Chambers, uh, uh, the Chambers Hiss case and the, the rest of the whole question of anti-communism? You had been involved in the battle in, in the Screen Actors Guild, I know. Was this a factor in your own political development? Well, this came about, uh, this started really before anything else mm -hmm. because it, I came back from the war to the industry and back to my post as a member of the board of directors of the Screen Actors Guild. And at first, uh, you know, we had just finished being allies <laughs> with the Soviet Union. And uh, so uh, my own brother tried to tell me that things had happened while we were all gone in the service and that there were changes in the motion picture industry. And uh, I wouldn't believe him and I thought, oh, this is Republican propaganda. <laughs> and then through that device of a jurisdictional strike in the motion picture industry, I discovered by actual participation in the meetings trying to resolve the issues of that strike on behalf of actors, discovered uh, that that strike was communist run and run by unions and guilds in the picture business, of which there are some 43, uh, that had been infiltrated and taken over. But there again, I actually discovered that I myself was a participant or on the board of directors of a couple of organizations that were communist fronts. Now in those days, that was the communist game plan, to take a legitimate organization that seemed to have a legitimate purpose, infiltrate, get control of the leadership, and then with the respectability of many of the members unquestioned, and the organization having a good sounding name start taking it down paths it shouldn't be going down. And I could tell you one experience of mine. As I began to learn first by way of this strike what had happened in our industry, I remember then leaving a meeting of the Guild Board and going to a meeting of this other board of directors where I was a member. And by now, I had gone public on, on the screen, on the motion picture problem. And I walked into that board of directors meeting of this other organization. Down the center aisle, slipped into a folding chair over on the one side. And every member of the board on that side of the room got over and crossed the aisle and sat on the other side, leaving me all alone on this side. And uh, I discovered <laughs> something I should have known before and parted. <laughs> severed my relationship with that organization. Did, did that have a, um, a role or a part in your uh, identification of yourself as a conservative finally then? Uh, or was that mostly brought about by the concern with government regulation? Well, I think, well, it was a combination. The, uh, the one was so, I had been, uh, I'd been making some speeches right after the war. You know, a lot of us came out of uniform and were concerned about uh, 
uh, suddenly after all that sacrifice, concerned about a world in which, uh, as you know, uh, uh, new automobiles were hard to come by and were almost rationed, they were so limited, and then you found the people that were saying, but for under the table, you can get one. And I was horrified, as a lot of us were. I thought, Did this, is this what we fought a war for? So I was kind of speaking out against uh, the uh, kind of fascist tendency. But I always did say, if at any time, I think the other side is, uh, represents the threat that I see in this, I'll speak out just as strongly against them. Well, it didn't take me long to find out that that threat, particularly in the picture business at that time, was very, very real. But again, this became part of my homework that I was doing to find substantiation and find actual cases that I could relate to in my speeches. When you felt the change in yourself and in your attitude, uh, did it manifest itself to you as a change to the Republican Party or to conservatism as more generally as a point of view? Uh, I would say to conservatism because, you know, all my life I'd come from a Democrat family and I'd been a Democrat all that time and come election times. Uh, the last president that I actively campaigned for and with was Harry Truman. And, um, and then, as I say, it was uh, getting up around 60, 1960, when I said what I did to Nancy. Now, I didn't get around actually re-registering until 1962. And by that time, however, I had begun to be a speaker at Republican fundraisers. And uh, because in the 1960 campaign, I had, while I was still a Democrat, I went the other way. Well, my first vote, Republican vote, was for Eisenhower as president. In that was uh, uh, 50, 52. 52. But uh, so by that time, as I say, I was a speaker at many Republican fundraisers and so forth. And in 1962, with the gubernatorial election uh, coming on in California, I was speaking at a fundraiser. And right in the middle of my speech, a woman stood up in the middle of the of the audience, and she said, have you re-registered yet? And I said, well, no, but I intend to. She said, I'm a registrar. And she walked right down the center aisle, put the papers on the podium, <laughs> I signed up, and then said to the audience, now, where was I? <laughs> uh, at the time that you began this change, um, liberalism was pretty powerful in Hollywood and uh, indeed in the country generally. Uh, and conservatism was uh, in many places unpopular. Did you have any trouble uh, with these new views or did you have enough company? Did you feel ex accepted? Oh no, it was a very funny thing. In all those years that I was engaged in politics for the one party, the more liberal party, uh, no one ever sent me letters and said, we're not gonna go see your pictures anymore because of what you're saying politically and so forth. But it was funny. The minute I switched and became publicly on the other side, You'd be surprised how much mail that kind that I got. And in the industry itself, pressures? Uh, I have a feeling, and, and not just for myself, there were many others. I, I believe that uh, there was a career penalty in it, that there were, there were certain individuals in the production and direction end and so forth that um, uh, couldn't quite see you as right for the part. And so you didn't get a part that you might otherwise have gotten. It's been said, uh, Mr. President, that your father-in-law, Dr. Royal Davis, was also an influence in turning you uh, toward the conservative side. Is that the case? You know, I have seen that over and over again in print. And I have to say to our friends in the media, why don't they come to the source and find out the truth? Dr. Loyal was so honest and so principled, and, and he was a Republican, I knew that. Now Nancy, and she'll be the first to tell you, uh, she was not, she was a apolitical. She hadn't been interested at all in that, so she wasn't influencing anyone any, one way or the other. And he never, knowing that I was a Democrat, uh, he never in any way ever brought up the subject or discussed it with me. It just uh, he was a, a good father-in-law who approved of his daughter's <laughs> husband. I saw an interview with uh, Mrs. Reagan not long ago in which uh, she was quoted as saying, and I was very interested in this, 
that she felt that your whole preoccupation with the Screen Actors Guild was an effort to put more, um, what shall I say, uh, substance or weight in your life than simply the acting profession gave it. And that uh, uh, this, therefore the change eventually when it came to politics was not as much of a change as, as it may have seemed, that you had all along been concerned with other things. Yes. It is true. I've, uh, well, first of all, the speaking really began when I was a sports announcer. Because, you know, uh, every year there's a lot of football banquets, high school or college and so forth, and you, as a sports announcer, find yourself being invited to be the speaker at a, at a banquet. But the, the serious end of the business came. Uh, I'd always kind of thought that you should pay your way, that you ought to be a good citizen, and that's why I... Uh, when both occupations, the one in radio and then later in pictures, made you uh, kind of an audience draw so that you could help somebody raise money and so forth, that you ought to use uh, the blessings that had been bestowed upon you to try and uh, do something in the public good. And uh, I had thought that, but then, uh, as a young contract actor at Warner Brothers, the Screen Actors Guild Board tried to be made up of people representative of the freelance actors, the contract players, the stars, the bit players, and so forth, so that the whole profession was represented in the board. And one day, I found that to fill a vacancy, which the board could do without going to the membership, I was called upon and they asked me to take a position on the Screen Actors Guild Board. And uh, so I did. And I have to tell you, uh, I'm a life lifelong member, a lifetime member, as a matter of fact. Uh, I think the only one that's ever sat in the Oval Office who was a lifetime union member. And I was so taken up by the real character of that guild and its dedication to the industry, not just to its own selfish affairs and all, that yes, it had a profound impact on me and then I wound up being six times president of the guild. And so we come at last to the uh, transition to politics, and I guess that began pretty spectacularly with the famous speech in October 1964. Would you tell us uh, how that speech came about, how you came to make it? Well, I had, because uh, our second home was in Arizona, Nancy's father and, and mother having a home there, and we'd go over every year and bring the children over and all, and in that way, I'm, I met Barry Goldwater, and I knew him, and I was greatly impressed by him, and I read his book, The Conscience of a Conservative, and uh, long before anything was being talked about, I said, this is a man who ought to be president. And when the time came, I was co-state chairman in California for his campaign. Uh, I was asked to be chairman, but I didn't know enough about political, the real, all the back scenes things of politics. So a man who had had experience in the party, that kind, I said, I'll be a co-chairman with him. And so I traveled all over the state speaking. And the speech that I eventually made was the one that I had been making and throughout the country. And one night I made it at a banquet, uh, not too long before the election time. And when the banquet was over, one table there, of really leading figures in the Republican Party, asked if I would sit down with them for a few minutes. They wanted to talk to me and they asked me if I would do that picture, if they made it possible on television. And I said, well, yes. So they raised the money independently and arranged for NBC to broadcast that. And I said that I thought it'd be more effective if they had an audience. So in the studio, they delivered enough volunteers for an audience and then it was taped and I made the, the speech. And incidentally, uh, I got a call from uh, uh, Barry Goldwater a few days before the speech was to go on. And uh, he said his people had, had talked to him. He'd never heard or seen what the speech was going to be, even though it was a taped speech. It wasn't done live. And uh, he said his people were talking that there, wasn't, there was only a little bit of time left and they wanted to use a tape of a program that he'd already done. I think it was his talking to uh, uh, Eisenhower at, at uh, Gettysburg, at Eisenhower's home and so forth. And uh, I said, well, uh, I didn't know that I didn't 
have any control over whether that speech could be used or not. And that group of people who had paid the money to the network for it, uh, they were the ones in charge. And I said, well, Gary, I, I wish you'd uh, uh, take a look or, or hear it or something, because I said, I've been making it around the state and, and uh, it's been rather well received and maybe it might be helpful. And uh, my brother, who was with the advertising agency handling his campaign, was at the hotel with him back in Cleveland or someplace where he'd made the call from. And evidently, they made available a soundtrack and played a soundtrack over the phone to him of my speech. And he called me back to tell me that uh, my speech was going to go on. Do you remember uh, who was at that table uh, in the, when you made the oh speech? Oh, yes, Holmes Tuttle and Henry Salvatore and the group of leading uh, people uh, that have always been backbone of the party in, in California. So you knew pretty well that the speech was a good speech and a successful one. You tested it out. Yes, but then I have to tell you, then the doubts set in. After I had recommended that it be played myself, then I said, who am I to start telling him what uh, something of the kind? And I really, I just lived with horror of what I might have done. Well, the speech went on, and about 11 o'clock in California, which was 2 o'clock in the morning back here, a campaign official of his called me and said they thought I would like to know that the phones, the switchboard was still lighting up, and the pledges were coming in. The speech raised $8 million. And it, it also had a much longer range effect, of course. Did you feel it immediately? Did, you, did people start talking to you or about you in your hearing as a possible political figure at that point? Well, no, the first intimation came in the following year, 1965. And if you remember, the party was well bloodied up by the primary contest in that campaign. And in California, it was split right down the middle. And a little group consisting of some of those same people that had been at the table that night at the banquet came to see me to talk to me about running for governor against the incumbent Democratic governor who was seeking re-election. And they put it in the basis that I could unify the party. And I just thought, there I never in my life had ever dreamed I would seek public office. I loved the business I was in. And I said, no, let me do the things I'm doing. I'll go campaign for whoever you decide is the right candidate. And they were very persistent. And they kept after us so long that finally I said, look, I'll tell you, if you will for the next six months, if you make it possible for me to accept all the speaking invitations around the state, because once you get on the mashed potato circuit, uh, there is a big demand for speakers, so you, you know that there are invitations out there. I said, I will let you know December 31st whether I should be the candidate or not, whether you're right or wrong about whether I could win. And I honestly believed that no, someone else should be the candidate. But I went out and they did fix it up. They hired one of those PR political firms and uh, I started speaking and accepting these and mainly political speeches, but not entirely uh, because I thought it wouldn't be fair just to go to a party. Uh, uh, a meeting of some kind, so it was Chambers of Commerce and opening of United Fund Drives and all that sort of thing. And uh, I was coming home as it got toward December and saying to Nancy, that maybe they're right about this winning business. And then we finally got down to, well, we couldn't sleep well and saying to each other, could we ever live with ourselves if they're right? And we said no about, and talking always about unifying the party healing this, this split, this wound. And finally, uh, I said yes, and I have to tell you something. I look back on it now, and I can't understand. I actually said yes only on the basis that I thought I could win the election. And I sort of, I went into the campaign before I realized that, yeah, but if I win, I've got a job for several <laughs> years. I'm in a different line of work. I'd thought only as far as November when I said yes. And uh, we did put the party together. I want to move forward, Mr. President, in time a bit to cover one subject that uh, may be of importance in the history of the conservative movement, in which you played a very, very large part, as in so many others, and that is the uh, battle over the Panama Canal treaties in the Carter administration, um, which 
you opposed the ratification of the treaties and led the opposition. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about the political impact in the country of that debate? What do you think it did in terms of public opinion and whether, what relation, if any, it had to the conservative movement that was developing at that time? Well, I think it was very definitely a part of the conservative program and platform that came that way. And I have to say that in all the speaking that I did about it, uh, very well received. I don't ever remember a divided audience or people uh, uh, that uh, supported the other side. Now, I went so far, however, as to make a suggestion because I believe in the good neighbor policy and I believe that, and believed then that uh, the United States suffered a great deal f south of the border and all the way down through Central and South America from that past image of the great colossus of the North and that we ought to be, and I suggested if we really wanted to do something about changing that, why didn't we create a kind of company and a board of directors with representatives on the board of directors of all the shipping companies that the, uh, made use of the canal? And that would include the countries down there. Well, that never got off the ground, and of course we know the canal was given away, and I, uh, I guess no harm has been done but uh, in the long run, but I still think that, uh, that there was no reason for that action to have been taken. How about the impact on yourself? Now, you had been, uh, you had lost the nomination to Ford in 1976. You were out of the governorship of California. You were a private citizen and, and leading this fight against the treaties. Mm -hmm. Did this have a significant political impact, do you think, on your own future with regard to 1980 and so on? I think it might have from the standpoint that uh, I've always said, uh, the people tell you whether you should be a candidate or not. And uh, maybe back because that's the way I first started out <laughs> uh, running in, in uh, seeking the governorship. But uh, I think that, the, yes, that further uh, kept me in the eye so that as 1980 began to uh, get closer, uh, the same thing was happening of I was being approached by people and groups and from all over the country who suggested that I should be a, a candidate. Now, as president, of course, you have an enormous amount of input from any number of sources in your staff and in the administration, uh, official uh, input. Is there any other place or, uh, from which you derive your own political and intellectual nourishment now in terms of uh, books or ideas, or, or does time just overtake you? I don't know. Well, I still read National Review and Human Events. <laughs> and. Uh, certain number of uh, columnists. They're outnumbered by the others, including yourself. Uh, but um, yes, I'm, I've always been a voracious reader. And I have to say that, that um, uh, the predominance of nonfiction over fiction uh, is quite sizable in recent years and has been. And uh, so I, you once told me in a letter that uh, uh, you keep a, generally keep a book by your bedside and read a little of it before you go to sleep at night. It generally takes you maybe a month to get through a substantial yes. book. But you then do have a regular regimen of, of reading or at least a, oh, a yes. program of it to, to keep yes. you Yes, and uh, outside of the weekends, it is mainly that bedtime reading. And now in the job, of course, and it was true when I was a governor also, that you uh, uh, you have to ration yourself so that you take the homework first, so that before you yeah. fall asleep you will have finished that, and then you pick up and for the balance of time you can keep your eyes open, read the book. How do you feel about the conservative movement today? It certainly has matured under your leadership. It has become politically very significant. Uh, has it, in addition to maturing, lost a certain dynamism? Are we? Uh, getting a little bit uh, long in the tooth? How you trade the cause. Right? Well, actually, what they wanted was, if you can't get everything, jump off the cliff with the flag flying in defeat. And I have always figured, look, if I can get 60, 70, 75 percent of what we're trying for, 
That doesn't mean you settle for that. You take it. And then from that point, you start trying to get the rest that you didn't get. And I think that that's happened to the movement also. We recognize that you're never going to be able to come in with a platform of every single thing that you want and get it 100%. There are still other people with other views that have to be convinced. Was there ever a time when you uh, felt that the uh, uh, Republican Party simply was uh, too narrow an instrumentality that it might be necessary to, uh, to reach for some new political formulation? Um, I, as you know, the idea was up and around. I was yes. involved in it and others. Just, was there a time when this ever struck you as a possible option? No, I'll tell you. As a matter of fact, I remember attending a meeting 